All right, in unit two, part one and part two, we looked at some of the fallacies of human thinking, we looked at descriptive methods, we also looked at correlational experiments, and we looked at, ex oh, correlational experiments is never the way to say it, by the way, don't ever do that. It's correlations and experiments. In this section coming up, we're gonna look at how we portray these things through statistics and visual ways, and we're also gonna look at some ethics, including animal ethics, how we treat our animals in the laboratory. We got Daisy the psychology dog to help us with that part. Okay, coming up right now in Unit 2, Part 3. Okay, with statistics, they're important because if you look at a research finding, what does it mean or how do we show what we found? Well, there are several ways to do it. Stats can become quite complicated, but for our purposes, they're actually quite simple and you can handle them quite easily if you just pay attention. The understanding, of course, is important just for all the reasons I've just stated. But we look at descriptive statistics, how to describe things. A really common thing, you've seen these before, they're bar graphs, we call them histograms. And they have little scales on the side and they show and they depict visually what our data will show. One of the things though, as a critical thinker, when you look at this, we're gonna go buy a truck. And this is, graph is gonna represent this histogram, the percentage still functioning after 10 years. So our brand, which is probably the one we're trying to sell you, you can see the representation compared to brand X, brand Y is horrible, and brand Z or Z, whichever you prefer, is really down in the dumps. Which truck would you choose? You would probably choose our brand, right? But what if the graph looked like this, our brand, shows it's up here, it looks really good. Brand X, pretty similar. Brand Y, pretty similar. Brand Z, pretty similar. Similar. Now, which one of these trucks are you gonna buy based on this information, these statistics? Well, if you look at these graphs, they are pretty, they are identical graphs. If you look at the scale, which is important to look at when you're reading histograms is to check the scale, you will see that they are exactly the same inf bit of information. So the, the one on the left really shows that we can be a little deceptive in our advertising without lying. So as a skeptical thinker and a critical thinker, you're going to make sure you pay attention to the scales. One of the things we can do when we look at results, um, the central tendency, where it ends up, a lot of us think of this as being averages and stuff. Well, what we call the arithmetic average is where we will take all of the data points, add them together and divide by the number of data points. We call that the mean. Okay, a mean shows us the average. Okay, a median, if we took it from smallest to largest and we took the score that occurred right in the middle, that is the mean. So mean is the middle score. A mode, is the most occurring number. So if there's repeats in there, the one that repeats the most would be the mode. Now it gives us a good idea of results and stuff, but we can have skewed distributions. And if you look at this chart at the bottom showing um, the average income in this town of a family, and it shows the mean income is $140,000. However, when we look a little more closely, we can see there are a whole ton of families not making the mean. And there's only three families, in fact, four making the mean or above. So it is totally skewed. So it's bad information. If we want to move to a town, we got a new job, we find out the mean is this, and then we find out the situation has been skewed this bad, it wouldn't help us very much. So what other things can we consider? Well, what we can look at is measures of variability. Measures of variability tell us how much the scores change from one another. So for example, a really simple one you may have learned in the past is called range. So if you took the highest data point and subtracted the lowest data point, it tells you the range of data that could be in there, how much it is spread out. So something that is spread out more probably isn't as accurate as if it's spread out less around the mean but it doesn't really tell us what's around the mean. However, standard deviation will tell us how much the numbers vary around the mean, which is a very good thing to know because the lower the standard deviation, the more we can trust those measures of central tendency and probably the more accurate the results are in the research. 
if we do research and we're testing a group of people and we have a huge variability, a huge standard deviation, there's a good chance that there may have been some chance incidents that, that made that occur. But if they're all similar, then it's a more, lot more likely to be more accurate. And it will also show that the mean means more than it does. I'll show you really quickly the calculation. But if we look at this chart, it shows test scores in class A. Just take a second and look at those test scores in class A. Now take a second and look at those test scores in class B. Now if we calculate the mean, you will find the mean of both of these classes is 80. So it sounds like both classes are doing really well, but if you look at those scores, you can probably look and see that one class is doing better. And if we go through the calculation of standard deviation, which I will teach you how to do in class, you will find that the standard deviation in class A is only 5, but the standard deviation in class B is 15.8. So that means the numbers spread out more in B from the mean. So really, class A really is performing more around 80% than class B is. It's because we have such a wide range. We have the two 100 scores, but look, we have the two 60s and the 70s scores. So class A is probably doing better and the standard deviation would let us know that. So with this standard deviation, um, when things occur, like we're going to take intelligence, for example, if we take all the people and measure their intelligence on an IQ test, what's going to happen is it's, it's going to form a bell curve or a normal curve. And this is what a normal curve looks like. Now, on this IQ test, the standard deviation is 15. So from 100 to 115 is one standard de deviation. From 100, 100 to 85 is still one standard deviation. So 85 to 115 is one standard deviation from the middle. Now there's a certain number of people that will fall in these ranges and I would like you to pay attention to these numbers and learn these numbers. So when we look at the ones that fall in one standard deviation from 100, which is the middle, there are 68% of the people that score within 15 points above or below 100. If we go two standard deviations, we're looking at 95% of the people. So the vast majority will fall into the middle of that normal curve. Once we go outside into the third, we're looking at 2% and so on outwards. So each of these are the, the standard deviations from the mean. And remember those numbers, one standard deviation either side equals about 68%, two standard deviations, 95, three would be about 98%. There's 2% on either side. Interestingly enough, in an IQ score, like on the Weschler intelligence test, a score of 100 to one, or 85 to 115 is considered normal. Between uh, 115 and 130 is superior. Between 85 and 70 is inferior. Above 130, you're in the top 2%. You're kind of, you're, you're meant some material then. And if you're below your intellect, you might have intellectual dysfunctioning. Okay, and we'll look more closely at that during the testing unit. Now, inferential statistics will tell us some other things. Um, what these are going to, is an observed difference reliable? Okay, so if I take a quarter and I flip it five times and it shows up heads, is it reliable that heads is going to show up every time? Well, inferential statistics will help us with this. When we look at research, as we've said before, if a sample is representative, it is much better than a biased sample. Okay, so less variable observations are more reliable than those that are more variable, so lower standard deviations. Okay, so the more we're closer to the middle, probably the more likely that it's going to be reasonable. And when we're looking at things, more cases are better than few. Always the more subjects is going to be more accurate. Um, but, you know, we don't always have the luxury of having a whole bunch of them. So what we will do is look at these through our inferential statistics, which we'll talk a little bit about, and decide, you know, is this observed difference reliable? Okay, is, or is it by chance? And when we talk about when is a difference significant, Okay, so a difference is significant. Say we, we're looking at comparison males to females and there's a slight difference. Okay, is it significant? And we look at, are the averages reliable? 
is what we've done reliable as far as our measurements because that would make it more statistically significant. The difference between averages is relatively large. So if we have a big difference between males and females, that's probably more significant. And does it imply the importance of the results? Is it something that is going to help prove or disprove our hypothesis? And these are the things that we'll look at statistically in order to determine if something is statistically significant enough or not. Now, to be statistically significant enough for publication in a journal, we have to show that the chances of our results are less than 5% that it could be by chance. Okay, so if our, you know, our research is not done in a proper way and our, re our stats when we take a, what we'd look at is a p-score at the end and it has to be less than 0.5 because 0.5 is the standard. Now, it's not a magic number. It's just a number the scientific community has decided that this is what is legitimate for research. So it has to go be better than 0 0.05, not 0 0.5, 0 0.05. 5%, 0 0.5. I'm going to put a little thing on there and make sure I got that right. Anyways, I know what I'm talking about. I'm just not saying it right. Okay, so let's look at some frequently asked questions about psychology. Okay, and again, here are the outcomes. So one thing that people ask all the time are, can laboratory experiments illuminate everyday life? Okay, it, you're right. It is different when somebody comes into a laboratory and does something with behavior because your behavior changes in the laboratory and it may not carry over into real life. However, when we look at what we're trying to discover, we're trying to find general underlying principles that guide behavior. And often they're easy to do in a laboratory because we can control the environment so well. So it is very viable to do laboratory experiments with people. Does behavior depend on one's culture and gender? Well, people will behave differently in different cultures, but again, it's the underlying things that make us human in our psychology that actually make those things. They just manifest themselves differently in, in many cultures. So yes, cultures will behave differently, and we'll look at a lot of cultural variations in class between different cultures. How close you stand to someone when you talk is culturally defined. There are many things. And gender. Genders are different, um, undeniably. There are there are many similarities between us genetically. I mean, we're pretty much identical except for the XY chromosome thing. And, but there are things that happen. For example, um, a women's sense of smell is better than a male sense of smell. But who smells better? Talking about sniffing, do males smell better or do females smell better? Think about that for a second. And I will tell you, females smell worse than males. And it's actually because of the way they secrete sweat. They secrete lipids in their chest, in their, in their armpits, that which the bacteria feed on, which causes the stank. And the males is more water. So females actually smell more. But I think they care more about it. So it's the guys in class that kind of stink. I know. Guys, go shower. What about ethics? Uh, animal research is a very hot topic for many people and, and many of you know you, you have animals and we feel very close to our animals and, and it's interesting, the cuter we perceive an animal or the more like us we perceive an animal, the more careful we're going to be with it. Many of us have no problem stepping on a spider, but it's, you know, is this life less valuable than a chimpanzee or a puppy? But there's something about it that makes it a little bit harder. But using animals in research is really important. Um, it's really helped advance science in many ways, especially, you know, um, therapeutic treatments, all those kinds of things in, in psychology and, and behavioral things. It, it really does help us out. However, there are strict guidelines for using animals. The animals must not be put to harm unless there is overwhelming evidence that's going to benefit human beings. And, of course, that can be controversial for some of you, too. I know I can hear what some of you are thinking, uh, but that's kind of the guideline that we have there. Most of the animals in the laboratories are actually treated better than a lot of house pets. So we have to be very careful. There's all kinds of safeguards for animal use, and there's very rarely is there cruelty to these animals. Human research, there's lots of ethics in human research, too. Um, 
one of the things is when you become a subject or you get subjects for some research that you do, uh, you, you have to lay out the whole procedure and it has to be approved by an ROB, an, a, a, an ethics board. The ethics board will say whether it's okay. And one of the things that you will also have to do is when you have a subject, you have to give them informed consent, which basically tells them that what you're going to be doing and do you cons consent to, a, to being part of this research with an understanding of what is happening. Now, in the past, there's been a lot of deception in research, and it's, it's much harder to use deception, but often there is. So there is a little leeway. Um, when we get informed consent to not ruin our research as long as it is, has been ethically approved. Um, we must protect our participants from harm and discomfort, whether it be psychological or physical. Um, if anybody in the research, you know, the subject says, I need, want to stop the experiment, they need to be released immediately. Confidentiality is always maintained. We never use names. We always make it very confidential so that uh, nobody would know who that subject is in there. And another important step we do is debriefing. Debriefing is going back to that subject and explaining exactly what you've done. If there's any deceptions, explaining those, telling them what results mean, and so that they don't feel like they're a bad person or that they've behaved in a horrible way because chances are they behave the way most people have. Okay, so these are the important things as far as ethics and research goes. So that's our unit on psychology as a science. Make sure you pay attention because once again, it is weighted pretty heavily in the AP exam. Our next unit is going to be on neuroscience in the brain and psychology is becoming very biologically based. So it's a very important one as well. We'll see you next time. We'll see you in class. Bye for now.